stand by myself, Tandy Conradi and Marisa Kutsia. Uh, Marisa is joining us from Cape Town. Um, and um, yeah, I, I've, um, I think everyone here has heard me speak. So Marisa, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, and sure, no problem. Um, so my name is Marisa Kutsia. I am a physiotherapist. Um, currently busy with my PhD at Stellenbosch University. And even though this is not work from my PhD itself, um, it is work that we've done um, two years ago. Um, I'm always very excited to, to talk about this topic. So yeah, um, once you bring up the slides, then we can start. I'm very aware of the time. So I'll um, do all the, the interesting parts and I'll skip all the boring bits. Um, and then we can see how it, how it goes. Do you guys right. want to see Mar Marisa? Let me just <laughs> close it so you can see Marisa. There we go. OK. All right, so the topic for today is spinal tuberculosis. Um, and we did a systematic review of case studies, which I won't bore you with the details, but we did develop an um, evidence-based clinical guidance tool for early detection of spinal TB. All right. So we'll do give a bit of an overview and recap the most important aspects, and then we'll um, skip the review bit, and we'll talk about the algorithm itself and do just one case, um, maybe two, but we'll see what the time does. Um, we will just demonstrate how the tool works. Marisa, I just quickly want to get rid of this top banner. Yeah. Bear with me. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, so you can go on to the next slide then. What's going on? <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. So just a quick introduction to TB itself. Um, TB remains a major global public health problem and is one of the most, the, one of the leading causes of death and mortality, uh, morbidity, sorry, worldwide. So it's in the top 10 causes of morbidity, uh, mortality. Um, the World Health Organization has estimated that uh, one third of the global population is affected by TB. Um, and currently we are seeing a bit of a re-emergence of TB and um, especially due to the increase in HIV prevalence um, and the development of drug resistance. So the concern is obviously that TB is the most prevalent HIV-related um, opportunistic disease at 56, 55, sorry, 54% um, in developing countries. So there are two types of TB. You get the pulmonary TB, which most of you are familiar with. Um, those are the TB in the lungs, and it is the most prevalent form of TB. However, there's also the extra pulmonary TB, where it is the isolated occurrence of TB in any part of the body other than the lungs. And this can be in lymph nodes, the abdomen, the genital urinary tract, the skin, the joints, and the bones. So extra pulmonary TB prevalence is at 14% of the known TB cases worldwide, which is also quite high. Um, and it can occur in isolation or along with a pulmonary focus, um, or it can involve multiple sites as a disseminated disease. And um, extra pulmonary TB without pulmonary involvement is not contagious. So spinal TB is a form of extra pulmonary TB um, it is one of the oldest diseases actually known um, because we've seen it in Egyptian mummies that date back to 9000 BC. Um, and in 1779, um, Pot, Percival Pot, the, the physician, published the first description of spinal TB. That's why it was, already, um, it was initially called Pot's disease. It's a destruction of disc space and adjacent virtual bodies, collapse of spinal elements and progressive spinal deformity. So in this picture that you see here is a picture that uh, Tandy took while she worked in the Eastern Cape. Um, the little boy in the front uh, is a boy who was born with spina bifida. So he is very used to his wheelchair. That's how he gets around. Um, and the boy at the back is now um, paralyzed because of spinal TB. So he wasn't born with spinal TB, of course. Um, so he got spinal TB and now he is 
um, paralyzed. So this little boy in the front is showing the, the little boy at the back how to use a wheelchair. Um, so yeah, just, just notice that it can affect anyone um, of any age. All right, Tony, you can go on to the next slide. So why are we focusing on spinal TB? Um, it is the most common form, as I said, oh, oh, no, sorry, I didn't say that, but it's the most common form of extrapulmonary TB. So at 50% of the cases of extrapulmonary is um, spinal TB. Um, and it leads to very high levels of disability and even death. So because of its uh, insidious nature, so there's usually a very gradual and very subtle onset of the disease, clinical diagnosis is almost always delayed. So disease progression can occur without any symptoms and patients are often seen by clinicians when neuromotor complications have already set in. Um, hence that leading to the poor patient outcomes, of course. So to address this challenge, um, we as a multidisciplinary team um, at Stellenbosch University developed a, a best practice model based on scientific evidence um, and then we develop this decision-making pathway to help with early diagnosis um, of spinal TB. And this training is for anyone. It's for medical officers, physios, um, nurses, home-based carers, students, anyone. Okay. So it is, of course, very important to detect it early on to um, decrease the disability. However, there are some challenges, of course, since we are living in Africa um, and early diagnosis is impeded by the lack of resources at primary healthcare level. So we don't have MRI at a primary healthcare level and other um, fancy investigative equipment. We lack knowledge from community and primary healthcare staff members, unfortunately, about this. Um, there's also poor access to transport uh, to clinics and poor compliance to um, the pulmonary treatment, um, which then can um, escalate into spinal TB. So just a little bit about the pathophysiology, just so that you understand why this can happen in the spine. So TB causes uh, the, the bacteria, causes necrosis in the affected tissue through granulous inflammation, and this involves lymphocytes. So it spreads through the lymph system, or it can, um, and it can ca cause a cold abscess. And then spinal TB is um, almost always a secondary infection that spreads through the blood or the lymphatic system from a primary site, which is very often the, the lung. Um, it can be lymph glands, it can be gastrointestinal or urogenital, um, but that's for adults. In children, actually, um, and adolescents, the discs in the spine um, is sometimes the, the primary origin because it's more va vascularized than it is in adults. So in children, it can actually be the primary site, but in adults, um, it's most of the time actually secondary. Um, so be very suspicious of patients that has um, pulmonary TB or lives in a house with someone with pulmonary TB because this can, can happen. So during the development of the infection, it can actually move up or down the spine or the vertebral column. And it is very common um, in the upper lumbar and lower thoracic spines, spinal second segments, especially at the thoracolumbar junction. And more than one vertebra is typically affected, which then results in a deformity if it's not picked up in the early stages. So it spreads through the, um, the blood vessels in the spine, um, goes to the vertebral bodies. Um, it can go to the um, anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments, um, and then this destroys the, the disc, destroys the ligaments, and then um, you lose all your stability in the spine. So it then wedges or sublux. And that's now with the more advanced phase, but um, because you don't pick it up early on, um, you only see it when there's collapse in the disc. Um, so yeah, that's very unfortunate there. So the, the key components for early detection of spinal TB, so the following things you can um, look at to help assist with early diagnosis. First of all, is look for associated factor um, of, that the patient might have, um, and we'll, we'll talk about those. 
then do an assessment for common signs and symptoms of spinal TB, flag significant clinical findings, and I'm sorry, I think there's still a <laughs> animation on that slide that makes it go oh. by itself. Yeah, that wasn't you. <laughs> and then um, flag significant neuroradiological findings um, and flag significant laboratory findings. Right. So the next one is now then the associated factors. So first of all, it is very highly prevalent in people with impaired immune systems. So these are patients with HIV, um, people who previously or currently has pulmonary TB, um, who has pulmonary TB exposure, so family members living with them in the house, uh, living in a TB prevalent country, so that's all our patients, malnutrition, um, alcoholism, drug abuse, smoking, diabetes, chemotherapy for cancer, and then patients under the age of 20 or over the age of 50 that presents with back pain. Um, you should be very suspicious there. Okay. Marisa, can I quickly just pause? Yes. Because um, everyone's taking pictures of the slides. Oh, of course. Um, so we we there is we're going to show at the end um, the paper and all of this information is in the paper. If you want the information, we can send it to you. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right, so clinical presentation and symptoms. So <laughs> this is the thing now. Presentation of spinal TB is extremely varied. Um, the presentation depends on the stage of the disease, the site where it's at, the presence of complications such as neurological um, deficits, um, abscess, abscesses or, um, yeah. So it can be obviously that it can be uncomplicated or it can be complicated. So uncomplicated will be when the patient is mostly experiencing pain or discomfort um, and some decrease in functional abilities. Um, then it's very treatable with um, your chemotherapy from TB medication. However, the more complicated is now when there's the presence of deformity, instability and neurological deficits. Um, and these people most often actually require surgical intervention. So the average duration of any symptom until seeking help um, or diagnosis is three to four months. Um, so it's important to understand that as a clinician, you need to obtain a thorough history and identify symptoms and associated factors that is indicative of spinal TB. Unfortunately, back pain is the earliest and most common symptom. And if you think about how often back pain presents at a, a primary healthcare clinic, um, you know, this is not really not the, the best um, thing to base your, your reasoning on. But yes, it's the most um, earliest and most common symptom, followed by fever, weight loss, and neurological complaints, um, which can range from pins and needles and loss of sensation to paresis or um, paraplegia. So um, considering the back pain, it is usually insidious. So a gradual and subtle onset of the back pain. So there wasn't a specific injury or a mechanism of injury or whatever. Um, you know, they can't really recall how it started and it's, you know, been going for a while. And then the nature of the spinal pain associated, um, like I said, is not mechanical. The pain is mostly localized to the site of involvement and can be mild or intense. Um, if there's some um, neural involvement. And the, pain, the patient can usually point to the area with, with one finger, so not the whole hand. Um, they can really, really pinpoint the area of pain. And, and like I said, it's usually in the thoracolumbar um, segments. Okay. Then, secondly, um, there can be the neurological complications. Um, so these are more common in patients with associated epidural abscess. So when the abscess, the cold abscess forms, um, you typically get these signs. Um, if left untreated, there's early uh, neurological involvement that can complete, you can lead to complete uh, paraplegia or tetraplegia. Um, and paraplegia may occur at any time um, and during any stage of the disease. So remember, there can be the active stage of the disease, but then it can also occur years later um, after the disease has, had occurred in the spine. Um, because then when there's collapse of that area, um, there, you can have these symptoms. So 
Um, the early onset paraplegia develops in the active stage and requires active treatment, but the late onset paraplegia, um, like I say, can actually develop years later, uh, decades later. Um, and these are the ones that you see with a very noticeable spinal deformities. Um, what is very concerning is that almost every second person with spinal TB in South Africa presents with paresis or paralysis um, when they get to the primary health care facility. Okay, so then the other clinical presentation symptoms is now the obvious constitutional um, signs that you typically see. So with, with uh, um, pulmonary TB, so these are fever, weight loss, decreased appetite, night sweats, um, and weight loss and fever is typically the most common ones. So now you're still starting to build your clinical picture. You know, you're asking all these questions, seeing what fits the bill. Um, and yeah, so next on is then the actual examination or the physical examination. Yeah. So there's no single test, unfortunately, for spinal TB. So diagnosing it is really not easy. Um, so you're going to use your clinical reasoning and differentiating between possible causes. So first of all, look for any, any signs of spinal deformity um, or even cold abscess. So as you can see, that little boy, he has an abscess in his neck, um, but this can be paraspinal. It can be, um, you know, or it can actually be uh, retropharyngeal. So you can have a patient that might uh, present with some dysphagia um, or hoarseness in his voice. Um, so it can be paravertebral, as I said, um, and then also it can be in uh, the lumbar region or in, um, even in the, the groin area um, where you might see it. So that's the first thing that you need to do. You need to look. Next is feel. Feel for paraspinal tenderness on palpation. Um, so they typically have pain with percussion. Um, of the spine. So what you would do is you put your hand on the spinal area and then you would percuss over it. Um, and if that is painful, um, it, it might be a, a, a sign. Um, and then spasm of the muscle in the surrounding area. And then next is measuring. It's really good to look at the muscle strength and we'll talk about that now um, as well. And then movement, um, spinal movement, asking them to bend forward um, sideways to see how much movement they have and, and where in the spine they are moving. Um, coughing and weight bearing, if that is actually painful for them. So if they cough, do they have pain in the spine? Um, because there might be some spinal instability and disc disruption. Okay. So when we ask our patient to move, um, this is a bit of a uh, quick neurological screening because you can perhaps already detect some very subtle decline in the patient's function, which they are probably not um, necessarily aware of. So asking them to sit or stand up from a chair, to look for difficulties getting up. Do they need the um, assistance with the uh, armrests? Do they have poor control in sitting down? Um, so do they just fall down on the chair? Um, and then uh, the hand grip, asking them to grip your hands, um, both hands, see if it's, you know, similar for left and right, um, and if there's any weak hand grip, um, because obviously this can also happen in the cervical area, so then you'll have some weak hand grip. And then single leg raise, ask the patient to stand on one leg, they may hold on to the bed because this is not a balance activity, um, and just ask them to lift their heel, see if they have difficulty um, doing that, maintaining balance, even though I said it's not a balancing activity, it's just if they struggle to, to stand on their toe, um, difficulty lifting the all of the floor and a difference between left and right. And then a very quick walking assessment. So asking them to just walk down um, the, the corridor, the pas passage outside, just look at their speed of walking um, and their pattern. Are there any obvious deviations, uh, uneven weight distribution, a wide base of support, limping, um, struggling to balance, do they need a walking aid, um, poor control of the hip, knee or ankle, um, and are they walking slowly? Okay. 
So there, there's other special tests that you can do for a spine under observation. So now you are, you know, you're getting suspicious of, of this person. So this is now, you know, what you would consider someone under observation. You can do a sputum test um, because 14 to 37% of people with spinal TB is co-infected with pulmonary TB. Um, and if there's a positive test, um, there's definitely an indication for further examination. Um, look at the HIV, CD4, and viral loads. So um, there might be an increased risk, increased risk for um, iris or immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So know the start of the ARVs or treatment. Was there a recent change? What are the CD4 um, and viral load counts? And then um, erythrocyte sedimentation rates, C-reactive protein and platelet counts. Look at the um, white cell count, hemoglobin and alkaline phosphatase. Um, because normal white cell count and anemic presentation is actually typical in um, spinal TB. But they might have elevated alkaline phosphatase, um, which may indicate spinal TB. And then <laughs> you can do the Montu um, skin test, but it's not really useful in a TB prominent country. Um, and it is affected by HIV and other immunosuppressive conditions. So you're yeah, not really uh, the best test. And then, um, so now you probably did a few... Um, special investigations, ask the, the nurse at the clinic to um, do a sputum sample. Um, and then before you send your patient home, you need to educate them. So all spinal TB suspect patients should receive education so that they can monitor and report their own symptoms. So they should take note of um, pain severity or pain behavior if there's any changes and what it is, um, any neurological conditions, um, loss of sensation, muscle weakness, pins and needles, you know, anything dodgy. And then um, a decrease in function, balance or gait difficulties, a new onset of constitutional symptoms and new onset of swelling anywhere. So our conservative management includes, um, you can do orthosis for thoracolumbar support. So, you know, back brace, because it's very important to support um, that fragile spine because of the ligament involvement typically, which will reduce the stability. And then dietary support um, for malnourished patients, um, physiotherapy and occupational therapy to address functional and neurological issues. Um, improvement of general hygiene is obviously also important, and then psychosocial support. Then chemotherapy, this is the treatment, um, the TB drug treatment. So we ha um, have standard drug regimes in South Africa where they do the quadruple um, tablet with the one with a combination of the four. Um, it's usually an intensive program for two months, um, and it can all go all the way up to 18 months. Um, until there's an, a bactericidal and sterilization effect. So in South Africa, we have our DOT system, which is amazing, um, and this is very helpful. Um, and then patients typically can receive a financial grant during this period of treatment. And then surgery. So when the patient has severe pain and spinal instability, and this um, can be in the more advanced stage, surgery is performed. So when there's spinal instability um, with anterior and posterior column involvement, then they will do a decompression, debridement, and a vertebral fusion. So I won't um, bore you with the details. I'll just quickly tell you that we did a review to identify common clinical patterns in case presentations um, and developed an evidence-based clinical guidance tool to help with the early identification of spinal TB. And Tandy, you can skip these slides until you get the one with the tool and then I'm going to hand over to you. I think we're making good time. Um, everyone wants to obviously um, have a bit of a Friday left. <laughs> so I'm going to mute myself for now. Okay, so the slides that we skipped um, explained how we developed the tool. Um, so we won't bore you with those details either. Um, and now the Zoom thingy is blocking <laughs> the, the first part of the tool. So um, basically the aim of the tool was to help with um, increased surveillance um, and to pick up TB spine um, as early as possible. So um, 
we um, just to state that uh, um, from what I've heard from Marega in, in Manguzi area, they hardly see TB spine, but where we worked at Madwaleni Hospital, we had um, we had quite a lot more TB spine um, cases, and the same was at Zitulele Hospital, and that's why Karen Galloway uh, from Zitulele um, wrote that paper. And um, what we also found was that once we had started the early surveillance, we were picking up cases much faster and we were able to prevent the secondary causes because before most of our spinal cord patients were as a result of TB spine um, and we had quite severe cases. Um, we also had the cold abscess um, and how I found out was because I thought his muscle was spasm and I <laughs> dry needled him and he came out with pus. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the first one, so so what the tool basically does, it's like an algorithm just to um, take you through the steps of how, if you do see someone with pain, and we've said anyone with, with any spinal pain, um, because of, of, of what we experienced and how um, sometimes they might have had an incident, um, but they also have TB, and we found because we've then um, said, okay, it's an um, incident, um, we're not going to screen for TB. So we took the point of view of screening every single, and I mean, when we say screening, it's, we'll go through it now, it's those fast things just check constitutional symptoms, blah, blah, blah. Standard, yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is, is that's not standard for everyone. <laughs> Sorry for everyone online, Marika said that's a standard back pain assessment, but um, it's not standard for everyone. Um, it wasn't standard for me when I first started practicing. <laughs> so, um, and, and what we've done with this also is this, we've, we've made it so that it can be used at primary healthcare level so that community, work, um, community workers and nurses at primary care facilities can also use it. Okay, and um, you'll see there's lots of seat boxes and I'll go through that later. We won't go through it because Marisa's actually touched on most of it. Um, um, but it, just to note that it is there so that someone who has gone through it, they can know what is there. So that yellow thing basically just says um, uh, um, someone with um, neck and spinal pain. Um, and because we are a, a prevalent country, we will, um, yeah, go on to the next. So what was the history and the nature of pain? So if it was traumatic, still ask for constitutional symptoms. Um, if that's no, um, refer to physio for conservative uh, management and educate. Um, and then um, check for improvement over six weeks expected. If no improvement, then you'll perform the investigations. If it's a negative test, um, suspect patient with no associated symptoms and follow the same process, educate, um, monitor and consult. Um, if it is an insidious case, we still assess for the constitutional symptoms. If those are present, um, you assess any factors associated with TB spine um, are present. If no, still um, just have a look at some of the um, 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 Plan. <laughs> investigations um, and um, then the same if it's a negative test go to um, the next block if it's a positive test then um, prescribe treatment and monitor if they do have associated symptoms present do the physical assessment um, and and that uh, um, identify at least one a sign associated with TB spine if there's none still do investigations um, if yes, then conduct a neurological screening. If that's um, negative, still conduct a test. Um, and if it's yes, refer to a doctor for surgical evaluation um, urgently. Um, and so just a note on that, um, the reason why our, in, in the Eastern Cape, we also were quite, um, the disability as a result of TB spine was prevalent is because our referring orthopedic hospital um, did no spinal surgeries, they only did traumatic surgeries. Um, and I have a very sad case about that, but I won't go into that, but it was just um, because they weren't performing them. So we, um, 
that's where the thoracospinal um, corset comes in. It's not very successful, but it's like more of just a precautionary measure and um, kind of helps if there's abdominal um, instability and just also mostly just an awareness for them themselves um, um, that they that they need to um, be careful um, with with that because um, oh my goodness if they have no neurological symptoms and you are trying to keep them to look after their back in the ward um, the number of times I saw them walking <laughs> it is very hard <laughs> so <laughs> we um we we would like just kind of prescribe corsets as soon as we heard they got tb spine um and later on we were actually quite successful in preventing quite a few but that was mostly because we were able to get them onto tb treatment as soon as was possible um yeah and so just to say also going through the development of of this tool um so it was very much we consulted with the nurse we consulted with i think all of you know prof Hofi, um and um yeah one of the doctors the tb doctors at madwalini hospital so we went through a like a process of just making sure that it's easily understandable and from every perspective um, um people were happy with it and so then these are just the boxes um that are there so that you can for ease of referral um, that you can refer to. Um, so that's that. Um, I just quickly want to have a look. It's 20 past five, so we do have more time. 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I just quickly want to see what's in the chat. Oh, Marisa, <laughs> thanks. No worries. Um, so what we thought was maybe just to go through a um, case study. Um, just to kind of, um, demonstrate how to use the tool. Um, so this first case is a 46 year old female, new onset lower back pain for about one month, slowly increasing in severity. There was no specific incident that she can remember related to the start of the pain. Patient is married with four children between the ages of 10 and four. Her husband works at the mines in Gauteng. She is now unable to do her housework due to pain. Her children are attending school and are too young to assist with housework. Sorry, before all this, I forgot to ask if there's any questions. Can we just go on with the case studies just for time? Okay. Okay. So there's supposed to be an animation there. But anyway, so we know that she's got um, insidious nature of pain. So what we're going to do next is we're going to assess if there's any constitutional symptoms present. Um, uh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, and then for the hist, then we're going to ask what is the history and the nature of the pain. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, during the sub, yeah. So during the subjective interview, she states that she does does have a loss in appetite. So that is yes for cons um, constitutional symptoms. Um, next, we're going to assess the factors associated with TB spine. Um, so she is HIV positive, she's on ARVs, but not always available at the clinic, So, but she has no other comorbidities. She lives in a TB prevalent country. Um, so next we're going to do a physical assessment um, to see if there's at least one sign associated with TB spine. Um, so she pointed with her finger to the lower lumbar spine to show where the pain is. Um, and upon physical examination, she also had tenderness around her lower spine with palpation, and she struggled to bend forward and touch her knees. So next, we're going to conduct a neurological screening. Um, so she is able to stand up and sit down in the chair in a controlled manner, and she could perform a left and right leg heel raise. Her hand grip was satisfactory for her age with no discrepancy between left and right. And when asked to walk down the corridor, no abnormalities were detected. So what's the next step? We're going to perform an investigation. Um, and so at primary health care um, in the Eastern Cape, um, I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the country, um, sputum sample is the most available um, investigation. So um, I know our nurses take it at the clinics too. Um, so that's the first one. And generally that is um, because it's 30% um, 
um, of people with um, TB spine have pulmonary TB. Um, yeah, so, but then if, if she doesn't, the sputum sample doesn't come back negative, what we would then do is um, do a PCR um, and an X-ray. And um, generally, if they um, had already were showing symptoms, we could already see degeneration in the spine. Okay. And then prescribe TB treatment. Okay. How are you guys doing? <laughs> yes. Yes, no, definitely. Um, so for everyone online, Marika was just saying um, that for Eastern Cape and Western Cape, um, TB spine might be more prevalent. But if we send everyone um, with associated factors for investigations, it's going to increase the lab um, results and the lab investigations and out-of-pocket expenses. Um, so yeah. So, Yeah, within the high prevalence of non-specific low back pain. Um, um, was there anything I wanted to say on that? Yes, Undini. I think it's very helpful to have such a tool. Um, my experience is that uh, the doctors are often not very aware uh, about a TB spine, although they see so many TB uh, patients. And even if I bring an X-ray which shows uh, degenerations, uh, they don't see it. So that was one of my uh, frustrations. But um, I think if this could be a published uh, tool available for everyone, um, it could be actually raising awareness and um, open up the minds for earlier detection mm -hmm. and intervention. So we, we see a lot of uh, data. Data on set. And so, Undine, I um, spoke to Madeleine Miller earlier today, um, and they, they did a, a presentation for doctors, and she brought in two specialists, um, one um, infectious diseases specialist and a orthopedic specialist. And even amongst them, they couldn't agree on the treatment even of what's the best treatment medically for TB spine. So there definitely is a lot more awareness that needs to be go around that. Um, funnily enough, in um, at Madhuleni, the reason why our TB surveillance went up is um, we had a pediatrician um, coming from America. So he was only trained to see um, children. Um, so he, but he couldn't even see children in the South African setting. Um, but he really wanted to learn about other um, um, adult medicine too. Um, and so he had around, he had a um, time in the TB ward. And once he'd um, seen us um, like treating patients with TB spine and going through that process, um, he read up about it. And he actually then started this increase, he sent almost anyone in the TB ward with pain for x-rays. And it was through that, we, I think we got uh, irritated at, the st at that stage, but it actually started increasing our surveillance. And we had a lot more people in our TB ward who had spinal TB that we picked up early. So it really, really, um, yeah, it, it's, clinical judgment, even though we were um, quite annoyed with having to do all those assessments, in the end, it was much more um, beneficial. Um, yes, Cindy.
no, that was a misunderstanding. You'll always give TB treatment because that's the first line. Um, and I, uh, yeah, that's a, yeah. Yes. Okay, um, hi, uh, two questions. One, in terms of the role of uh, rehab uh, practitioners, when in the treatment of TB spine do you get involved? Do you get involved um, at diagnosis or do you wait after up, 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 up to a particular period of starting treatment or when exactly do you get involved? Um, the second thing is just a comment that um, you must always remember that doctors um, are not very good at reading uh, bone x-rays um, unless they are orthopods. So we rely on, on, on you guys to, to interpret them for us. I am so glad that uh, we, I've met one doctor that has admitted that. Because <laughs> the number... The number of x-rays I have taken to doctors <laughs> and they have told me, no, nah, it's fine. Um, yeah, <laughs> but luckily, so I think the, the nice thing was that the, the orthopedic surgeon um, that Madeleine was involved with, his son was a, a doctor at Madwilini. And so um, because of that, we, they were, had a lot more training in, in x-rays. Um, so for your first question, um, so, at so I mean it's it's very it's various if you when rehab gets involved um from place to place and where it's picked up. Um so at what we did at Madwaleni Hospital, and I think it was the same at Zitulele Hospital, um, was that um most of the time because we were TB hospital. So a lot of the more complicated cases got sent to Madrilini Hospital. And so as soon as they picked that up, we have got involved immediately because then we would send them for a corset and we would advise and educate um, them from, from day one. Um, then when, when, they do, when we do see them presenting with neurological conditions, um, then we're constantly involved um, just help, helping them with bed exercises, mobilizing, um, ensuring um, the stability of the spine. Um, and then obviously once they are um, spine, once they have a spinal, um, spinal loss, spinal functional loss, sorry, um, then obviously we're very involved. Um, and and um, yeah, I think we were, we were a unique case because we had a long-term ward. So they would immediately go into our long-term ward where we saw them every day, um, like a spinal cord injury. But of course, first we um, waiting, because we didn't have any surgical intervention, um, we first waited for um, spinal fusion to take place. And then that depended on the therapy that we actually gave them. Um, yeah. Um, Marisa, I don't know if you had any more comments on that. No, no, that's perfect. Exactly. That's, um, I think we should be involved um, from early on, um, because we can um, help with the education as well and just the monitoring um, of the patient as well. But yeah, strengthening and support um, of the spinal segment involved is very important and we do play a valuable role in that as well. Indeed. I want to relate a system failure case um, uh, with the question how far nurses, PHC nurses, and also doctors have the red flags uh, in their training presented. Um, I had a lady who was for six months uh, at different health levels presenting her symptoms, starting with a slight limp, um, with a more severe limp towards getting uh, really a para a paralyzed uh, one leg, then two legs, and ended up quadriplegic and uh, um, paraplegic until she came to us. We then pushed for the treatment uh, and 
so on. So I was so sad about this uh, system failure because this person has been reporting to health uh, facilities and has not been assisted. Uh, it was bagatellized uh, what she presented at the already visible stage. I also just wanted to add as a last thing, um, because I was um, at Madhuvalini for a few years and were a was able to see some of um, the persons with spinal TV over years. The positive thing is that with the starting the TV tree, <laughs> sorry, everyone online, the monkeys just came to steal the scones. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, was that with over time, because a lot of it goes with the fusion of the spine, the inflammation and the abscess, etc. And with um, strengthening and rehab, um, we had seen um, persons with spinal TB who were completely paralyzed um, start walking again. And that's really positive. Um, and um, if you want to hear the whole story, I'm not promoting my blog, <laughs> but I have, I did write um, this, this, this specific lady's um, story up on my blog. And then um, I was hoping to share another one with a boy that really like, it was almost worse than your case, Undine. And um, so, yeah, um, but that's it. What's my? It's called... Rural rehab reflect no, rural rehab reflections. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to go and see. <laughs> I haven't posted since last year. <laughs> um, any more questions on the web or comment? Um, I'm just going to post a link to a oh. video. Um, here she of a YouTube. <laughs> but um, therapists and doctors are very bad at routinely asking red flags. Um, and we really should be hammering that point home because in our rehab department, we're picking up a lot of um, serious back pain if we ask red flags coming through. Not a lot, but I mean, like, obviously you say a lot because it, you remember those cases and, and, and it's traumatic and stuff. Um, but yeah, it is, it is not routinely done and it really needs to be drummed in. So one last note, and the reason why that is so important again is just because we, there was a case where those, um, um, questions weren't being asked where a therapist um, ended up mobilizing a spine for someone who had positive TB spine. So it really, really just, and, and, I, and I think from that experience, the problem is that it starts at undergrad level. We are not... Yeah. Yeah, America just added that there was a lot of people being treated with um, red flags. So it, um, we are trying to promote it at undergrad, but it really is a um, huge thing. Oh, it's AGM time for those of us that are gonna join, but thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Mar uh, Marisa, for joining me from Cape Town. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we'll speak again. Cool. Thanks, guys.